Well, me and about 50 other people, wonderful volunteers. We are so appreciative of everyone that's here today and everyone that's worked so hard for this event. We've got about 50 volunteers and docents here today from all over the Metroplex, mostly DeSoto folks that have been planning this on the Ad Hoc Committee, and the DeSoto Texas Historical Foundation is very appreciative of everyone's hard work been working on this for two years. We needed to complete the first initial construction phase before we could get to this point. So now we're fundraising for the next phase. We are the windmill stop and our windmill needs to be replaced. So we're asking you to consider uh, making a donation for our windmill. We'd like to be able to retrofit the pump so that it collects water in the back tank for irrigation purposes, to water the crop, any animals that we might have as we uh, restore the whole farm. The windmill is an important part of this farm. We try to keep up with you. We know that you live down on Park Grant. Maybe that's not your business. Yep, yeah, it is. Yeah. And, uh, we love it. So anyway, I've asked Mr. Vicky two or three times because I keep seeing you there. Dairy Queen. Yeah, we can't go through there, John. They moved down on Park Grant. I don't know where on Park Grant. Almost to the freeway. Almost 30. Where I'm ready, I'll make machine where you used to be. brother and I, Ron, were the last Nancy's to live on the farm. We uh, moved off the farm in 18, or 1953, and we were the last Nancy's. From there, it went to uh, a, a 
a gentleman named Foy Wildman that owned Good Luck Oil Company, and then he sold it to Mickey Mantle, and Mantle uh, developed this into Mantlebrook Farm, you know, and made millions of dollars while we moved to Oakland. He was from Texas. Uh, actually, he was from Oklahoma, but he moved to the Dallas area. And retired here and raised his family here. I had a lot of rabbits and I brushed their fur and turned it into yarn like out of fur. One of the colors is a different rabbit. I would spin off of one rabbit and put it aside, get another ball of yarn off another rabbit until I got enough to knit that sweater. And then the AR thing, they encouraged me to enter it in a contest. And that Went to Austin, Kansas City, Miami, working way up, up and up through the ranks till it finally won first prize in Washington. Wow. Well, I stayed home and nobody paid my way to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> but your work went there. <laughs> my work went there and I had to get rid of those rabbits so they kept getting fleas and I couldn't get that program medicine to use on dogs and it made me nervous just thinking about those fleas shut up in that cage. <laughs> and I'm trying to scrub. So this fiber is wool. It's a lot easier to keep a sheep out in the field than it is a rabbit in the cage. <laughs> no, I didn't keep this rabbit. This, this sheep, I bought this shop. And they don't have a good shop like this in DeSoto, but there's one like this. fired by my great-great-grandfather uh, and it was taller than he was. And then where the wooden pegs were put into them for support. That makes it extra strong. This type of construction dates back to the Egyptians and Moses that era so that it makes it very unique and valuable. The planks were carried from pre in the back and all hand you and it's the same as you can right here. Of course they used a hatchet and a well to scrape and do uh, the wood and then take so that it fit into the holes for the support. Now they Nail, uh, nails in, or too much. But this is the type of hand forged nail that was yes, used was in the yeah. construction. Wow, yeah. so, square. Uh -huh. You put the iron in there and hammer it down and let it cool. Actually, it was built flat on the ground. They raised it with the concrete to the position where it is now. When they removed the tank, uh, they put this top up. And generally, uh, during that period, they would hang the tank and let it uh, sort of tilt, which helped with the irrigation. And so now, after we get the remodeling done, this particular structure will be tied in with the windmill pump. And that'll be used for irrigation of the property. Shed. It was built in 1859, and the Nancys used a curing technique they brought from Illinois. They didn't have the smokehouse like most people did down here. They uh, hogs hung the hogs and sheep from the rafters inside, stuffed them with spices and preservatives, and roast kept them for roasting at a late date. It was built from hand-hewn logs from Heath Creek using hand-cut nails. The uh, building will be restored moved about 10 feet north to where the chicken coop used to be and elevated to keep from uh, rotting, keep the floors from rotting out. This is the well. That's okay. The well, they found
found five or six uh, wells on the property. One's located in a garage and a cul-de-sac. They found some shards of glass and pottery, dug up a swimming pool that was here. They're trying to uh, restore storage walls, the vintage pulley-in bucket, and for educational programs. This is the kitchen, and on the uh, north wall there was a stove, and you can see there's a hole in the ceiling, and that's where the flue pipe was. This wall, they had the window and a chair and a table where they uh, eat or roll out pies. Uh, the adults would eat in here. We have a representative sink from the time frame of around the 1900s. And on this side, they would have a pie safe. Uh, right now, we've got a uh, period ice box. This is uh, what an early uh, 1900s farmhouse, maybe late 1800s farmhouse wife would have had on. And because the lady of this house, Sarah Nance, was frequently pregnant, I have on a tea top. <laughs> my apron. <laughs> Mrs. the original Nance had 13 children. That's right, and 11 of them were born here on this farm. Hi, I'm here. I'm pleased to be volunteering. Uh, I am associated with Mr. Richie, his uh, fiance, and I'm just happy to be able to volunteer and do what I can to fill in, and it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, this is the dining room. There were 13 people, uh, children in an answer. This is a household. So there was a table that had 15 people each uh, meal in this room. There was a fireplace over in the corner. And this window has been replaced, but it is of, of a period. The uh, door here at one time was, was here, but it was moved, so that we were room in the kitchen. We hope that we can you know, bring this back to the original, so that we can do something of our, of our age and, and a place for people to realize where their heritage was and such. Go ahead and proceed through the line, but first I'd like everyone that's able to stand so that we can pledge to the American flag. Color guards advance. Present the colors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Post the colors. Be seated, please. Thank you, Troop 1141, led by Tim Meeks. The first DeSoto Boy Scout troop was founded by pioneer descendants, and the first leader was Jimmy Judah, whose family was among the first settlers in DeSoto, so we're glad to see that we're carrying on that tradition. I'm pleased to introduce to you a person who has shown great interest 
and support in the Nance Farm Project, may I present the Mayor of DeSoto, Carl Sherman. We want to thank Troop 1141 again. Uh, these young men uh, have worked tirelessly and they've been dedicated to this community. And so we just want to thank them again officially. <laughs> this is certainly a great event and occasion in which we've all come together. Uh, in looking at all of the dignitaries uh, that are here, uh, I want to recognize the uh, fellow city council members here, uh, Councilman Jerry Edgen, Councilman Sandy Respis, uh, Councilwoman Patricia Ledbetter, also uh, I, I know that he's on the program, but our former mayor Bobby Waddle, as well as former mayor Michael Hurt, and former city council member Jim Strom. I apologize if I've overlooked any of our council members, so if you're here, would you please stand? Well, tonight is a big night for us because we are certainly at a point where uh, we are proud to display all of the work that's been done thus far because of the historical foundation the folks have been working on this for quite some time and this uh, would not have happened without uh, the work of previous councils as well as our state representative Helen Giddings when you look at projects like this and I, I see uh, former mayor Roy Orr too the tenth mayor of DeSoto here so uh, as well as the former county commissioner uh, when you look at this project, it doesn't happen just uh, by hap ac accident. It's, uh, it has to be planned. Uh, and so all of this happens because someone moves beyond if only. Perhaps some, one of the saddest phrases that I've ever heard tongue or pen are, it might have been. There are so many people who live in the if only world where they talk about if only we could do this, if only we could do that. Arguably one of the most historically innovative inventions was the telephone. In 1875, a man named Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, but there was also another man named Elijah Gray from Overland, Ohio, who filed for a patent just two hours after Elijah Gray two hours after, if only he had gotten there a little earlier. There was a man named Joseph Hazelwood who was a skipper of the Exxon Valdez and if only he had been paying attention, maybe we wouldn't have that oil spill. But we don't have to say if only because we've got some great folks who have worked hard and tirelessly to make this day happen. And so we need your continued support uh, for this project. Now, uh, am I to do the invocation now, or? Please. Okay, all right. Shall we pray? Mm -hmm. oh, Holy Father, we come before your throne at this time, Father, as one people, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the strength. Lord, for if it had not been for you, we would not be here, Lord. Lord, we thank you for loving us despite ourselves. Father, thank you for giving to us, even when we've not been so lovable at times, Father. May we please you not only in public, but in private too, Father. And may this project, Father, give honor to our history. May we in some way represent you in all the things we do and say. Give those who work on the historical foundation renewed strength, renewed vigor, that they may do more things in this community and we thank you, Lord, for entitling all of us to be here this day. Blessed is your name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Mayor Sherman. Now I'd like to introduce a man who is a retired Air Force Colonel, former DeSoto City Council member, former DeSoto mayor, rancher, neighbor, and my friend, Bobby Waddell. Thank you, Mary Kay, and it's a, a great honor to be here, and uh, I told Don Dewberry he may have to help me up the steps here. Uh, I felt like I'm elevated. Uh, mayor and distinguished uh, honorable mayor and, uh, and city council members and distinguished uh, folks who are here today, and, and all of us are, I consider everybody a VIP. You're here today, and we're here for a special reason, and I'm really honored to be a part of this today because this is history, and I mean big time history in Dallas County. I recall when Jim Ball and I went to closing on this Nance farm, and the discussion went before the council, and <clears throat> Carl, and you were there, and, and, and others, and we talked about Nance farm, and you know, we had one opportunity, and as, as many of you know, the city owned this originally, then it went to private hands, and we had one other opportunity to make that move, and thank goodness we did. And we will always be pleased that the city of DeSoto made that move, and we recognize the history that is here today, because this is probably, if not the only one that sits on the original site in this part of Texas in, in, in Dallas County. So there is a lot of history here, and I kind of relate my grand grandparents being here, they came in 1843, and the Nazis came, and they're all part of that history, so you really feel a part of it. And everyone that lives in DeSoto, you know, we have something to show. We have history here. We have a start, and we will get those funds. They're going to come, and we're going to work it hard, and this will be a real destination point in DeSoto. I really want to, I, I, I'm not sure, is uh, Representative Giddings, I, I have not seen her, is she? Okay, well, I want to I want to give her credit. Uh, I think Michael, uh, Michael Hurt was mayor at that time, and Representative Giddings kind of questioned, is there something we can do? And Michael, being a quick move, said, yes, we're, we're going to look at this, and perhaps you could help us. Well, she helped us. And God bless her, uh, and we'll always remember her for that. But she was able to get the legislature to set aside $500,000 for the preservation of this historic site. And she's always been a great friend to DeSoto. She's a great member of the state legislature. And, and Helen also recognizes the value of history because if you look at her history, she goes way back in this area in Dallas County. So uh, I, I, I certainly want to commend her and for all the great things that she does, not only on the Nats Farm, but for what she does in our area and, and for this city and community and her district. Uh, I have a little thing, and, and Mary Kate, I'll show it. I don't even have one, but Helen was going to get the first one, and she's still with me. But the Historical Commission has commissioned a historic coin and you know, the city of DeSoto has one, and the police department has one, the chief, the fire chief, they all have one. But this pertains to Nance Farm, and it's just a great memento, and I commend the Historical Foundation for adopting this. I can't get one, Ray. Uh, I'm sure I'll get one one day. But I, this is Helen's, and this is the first, and what her know is going to be the first. And, uh, we'll we'll catch up with her and we'll make that. I, I, Mayor, thanks for doing all those introductions. I think there was, uh, I think, uh, former council member Janice Groupie is in the group. No, oh, thank you, Janice. Okay. And I, I think you did a great job, Carl. I think you got everybody. I know Roy R. was sitting way in the back. He's already missed right there. I hope I didn't miss anyone else. But anyway, thank you, and it's a real honor to be here. And, uh, I'm looking forward to getting this windmill fixed, Mary Kay. You know, I want to see some wind moving that thing. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And God bless all. God bless America. And God bless the soul. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate that. As you can imagine, it's village to put something like that there. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to do a couple thank yous here. I'd like to thank all of you for your attendance today. I hope you enjoyed tours and found them to be informative. DeSoto is an America city where amazing things happen. Where an ordinary citizen like Ian Don and a local real estate fellow like Bill Ritchie can plant a seed of opportunity. And the city of DeSoto, Mayor Waddle, Mayor Hurt, and their council make it happen. And Mayor Sherman and his council support the continued restoration project. As you can see from the tour, Nancy is currently in the rough. But the citizens, the DeSoto, Texas Historical Foundation, Bill, Don, and I have all the confidence in the world through your expression of interest today and your help in communicating the opportunity message to others that we will accomplish all four phases of the next Farm Restoration Master Plan and make each and every one of you and the state of Texas proud of the gem that Nance Farm and DeSoto deserve it to be. With 20-foot log vertical frame structure, she is thought to be the oldest structure of her type standing on her original land in Dallas County and possibly in the state of Texas. I'd like to thank the members of the Silver Serenaders President Mary Crawford and our own board member Mickey Starling and husband Lynn for their wonderful music today. This was just a small sampling of their group and they performed in various venues across the nation, most recently the Meyerson. Have you enjoyed their performances today? The volunteers in period costume represent the old Chisholm Trail, Daughters and Sons of the American Revolution. Thanks, Elizabeth and Charles Reed, for gathering participants from across FW to participate today. The volunteers on the event ad hoc committee are Roy Orr, Janice Orr, Michael Hurt, Marilyn Hurt, Renee Thomas, Lee Merriman, Connie Johnson, Kathy Jones, Scott Brown, Nathan Busby, Linda Tate, Lynn Cornegy, Pamela Cheshire Dean, Bobby Waddle, Linda Zander, Mickey Starling, and Don Dewberry. These folks have spent thousands of hours to create this event while at the same time planning for the public grand opening to be held April the 28th. DeSoto, Texas Store Family Board members, please stand or wave. Don Mills, President. Claudine Jones, Treasurer. Ruth Vijay, Secretary. Jim Strom, ex officio, representing the Mandelbrook Homeowners Association. Mickey Starling, Historian an ex officio representing the Meadowbrook Homeowners Association, John Scoggin, Bill Ritchie, Joseph May, the Honorable Jerry Edgen, who is our liaison to the DTHF board, Laura Stallings, who is East liaison board, and her daughter Sarah Elizabeth, who is our youngest volunteer today. And I'm Mary Kay Berry. I'm the Vice President and PR and Marketing Director of the board. Special thanks to DeSoto citizens who provided your tour today. Janice Groupie, Patrice Spears, Myra Rind, Kurt Osher, Karen Victory, Shirley Sneed, Carrie McCrossan, Carrie Scott, Cherokee Sahagan, Ed Hilsher, Holly Curley, Elizabeth Reed, and Laura and Sarah Stallings, Evelyn Trowell, and Virginia Baker. We thank you for the months of preparation you've spent to make this event so special. Thank you to Chef Carlos who is a resident of DeSoto and his business, A Different Plate, is in Lancaster for providing our food today. How was it, folks? <laughs> Thanks to the guests who stayed at DeSoto Hotel. Once the project is completed, DeSoto will become a historical destination and with many more heads in beds with our events at Nance Farm. Thanks to Johnson Chapel and Hampton Road Baptist Church for allowing us to use their facilities for remote parking. With other activities scheduled in Soda today, we were not able to use the parking at Town Center, so we appreciate their generosity. I'd like to thank my husband, Don, for the hundreds of hours he's invested in the preparation for this event, 
as well as providing the first aid station with Gordon Steenberg and the Best Southwest Community Emergency Response Team. We thank former Mayor Bobby Waddle and his council members for recognizing the importance of acquiring and restoring Nance Farm and preserving the history of DeSoto. Without his help and coordination, and also Mayor Michael Hurt, with State Representative Helen Giddings, we would not have been able to obtain the grant from the Texas Parks and Wildlife to accomplish the initial construction phase. We thank the former mayors, Roy Orr and Michael Hurt, and Janice and Marilyn, for your support and efforts for this event and the restoration project. And Mayor Sherman, you and the current council members, as well as City Manager Don Richardson, are appreciated for your vision to continue supporting and moving this project forward. As we continue to celebrate life as an all-America city and the diversity of our town, it becomes even more important to record the history of the evolution of DeSoto. When I was asked by members of the Ad Hoc Committee to speak today, I tried to talk to an professional speaker. There are many folks at this gathering who live the history, and I'm a newcomer who's only lived here 38 years. But our goal was to keep the expense down and the results up, so here I am. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of DeSoto. What is history? The word itself contains root word, his, and story. Just as we will gather with family and friends next week for our Thanksgiving feast and bring each other up to date on the happenings of the past year, as we leave the table, each guest will have a different recollection of the conversations. So history is really his story of the recollection of when in our town end. As the city of DeSoto repurchased Nance Farm in 2007, saving her from the foreclosure auction block, and Mayor Waddle and his city council, Mayor Hurt, and members of his council appointed charter members of the DeSoto Texas Historical Foundation. We set about with our request for proposal, recommendation to the city for the hiring of Boozy Otis and Company architects. Representing the architects today is Ann Abernathy. Ann, where are you? Back to back. Thank you for your partnership and efforts on this project. It was invaluable to us to gather the chronology and the history of this property, which was a, an invaluable contribution to the history of our town as well. So thank you very much. A master plan caning four phases was approved by the City Council and the initial construction phase has been in completed, including asbestos abatement, the erection of a visitor building with ADA compliant restrooms, the building of a fire lane, re-roofing of the curing shed and the milking barn, replacement of the front and back porches and steps, replacement of the front fence, relocation of the entrance gates, rewiring and replumbing the house, replacement of heating and air conditioning units, and cleanup of the grounds. This is a brief list of the many tasks accomplished by Dustin Brown Rice and J.R. Jones Construction Company. We thank them for their hard work to ready the property for this preview event. Thanks to the State of Texas Historical Commission for their many resources that they've provided us 2006 when we were exploring the possibility of the reacquisition of the Nance Farm property. Support and coordination have been both patient and responsive to our request before, during, and after the initial construction phase. The historical, architectural, and artisan world is a very small, specialized, and limited. The cost is higher than modern construction, and the pace is slow and tedious to ensure the historical value is protected and recorded every step of the way. Once you lose history, it's gone forever. You don't get it back. As we talk about DeSoto, we have to include Lancaster, Cedar Hill, and other sister cities. In the early 1840s, we were all settlements on the vast Texas prairie, not official towns. We depended upon one another for services and for survival. We were the best Southwest long before the city limit signs were created. In 1836, Texas had won its independence from Mexico, and in 1841, the Republic of Texas was on the brink of bankruptcy. It needed to attract t new immigrants in order to survive. With this important goal in mind, in 1844, the Texas Congress authorized the President of the Republic of Texas, Sam Houston, to contract with individuals 
to colonize the state. In September that same year, one group headed by Captain Roderick Rollins from Illinois came to Texas settle in what would become the town of Lancaster. In the 1800s, Lancaster, Duncanville, and Cedar Hill were connected to the rest of the state by the railroads while retaining their small town character and charm. DeSoto was first settled in 1847, just 11 years after Texas won its independence from Mexico, making us one of the oldest communities in North Texas. The Nance Farm was established in 1847 when the milking barn was built. It was customary that a shelter for the work animals would be built first and provide shelter for the family as well until the farm became productive and they could afford the money and the time to build the farmhouse. In 47, the city of DeSoto did not exist. We were a settlement in the Texas Prairie. The Nance family had traveled by wagon train from Illinois to Tennessee to Texas and chose to settle on the banks of the Heath Creek. The initial 640-acre headright was awarded to Carlos Wise by the Peters Colony established by the Republic of Texas. He transferred ownership to Otway Bird Nance less than a year later. Otway B. Nance registered a patent on the land and earned several more parcels growing the farm to 1,650 acres, which was larger than the city of DeSoto is today. Another settler, Crawford Trees, married Anna Kimmel on July 22, 1846. Theirs was the first marriage license issued in Dallas County, and a copy is held in the cornerstone of the old red courthouse in downtown Dallas. Crawford Trees also grew his farm to 1,650 acres, and that farm has continued for over 160 years, and today is operated by Trees' descendant, Bobby Waddle. The Nances raised sheep, chickens, corn, and cotton. They held no slaves, but did have hired hands working the fields and helping with 13 children. They provided room, board, and wages to their hired help and awarded them a parcel of land when it was legally okay to do so at the Emancipation Proclamation. And today we have with us Frida and Kevin Pratt, who live a couple doors down from Nance Farm, and they are related. We have finally found out who the servants were, and it was Mr. and Mrs. Bubba Porch, so we're gonna gain some more information from them as we grow our relationship. They prospered in farming, growing this land to several thousand acres, donated a parcel to the township of Wheatland, and provided material to build the Wheatland Methodist Church and Cemetery, where he and his wife, Sarah, are buried. They have memorial stained glass windows in that church. The cloth-backed wall coverings, which we recovered in the Nance farmhouse during the asbestos treatment, are the same remnants found in the attic of that church. We are honored to have Nance family members with us today. We thank you for your gracious generos generosity excuse me, in sharing Evelyn, Nance, May, and the rest of your family with us family photos, documents, hours of interviews, and for joining us today. From the date the milking barn was built on Nance Farm, it was 102 years before we would incorporate under the name DeSoto. We applied to become the city of Stewart, but by the time the postal circuit riders delivered our application to Austin by horseback and it was manually processed, the name Stewart had already been used. Because the consensus of the 52 eligible voters was to name the town after their beloved horseback traveling physician, Dr. Thomas Hernando de Soto Stewart, it was decided to use one of his other names. And in 1949, we were incorporated as the town of de Soto. The drive to incorporate was due to the need for an adequate water supply. A petition was circulated and delivered to Dallas County on February 17, 1949, requesting a ballot for the voters to decide whether or not to incorporate. The vote was taken March 2nd and entered into the records on March 3rd, 1949. The vote was 54 and 2 against. Wayne A. Chowning was elected the first mayor, along with five aldermen. T.O. Hash, Malcolm Ham, S.I. Vaughn, 
Roy E. Spurgeon, and A.P. Bagby. The first city council meeting was held at the Old White Frame Schoolhouse on East Beltline Road, about the spot where the fire station currently stands, on March 17, 1949, with C.H. Estes appointed as the first city secretary. It was determined that the city of DeSoto had a population at that time of about 400, thus becoming the 19th organized municipality in Dallas County. The new city was less than one square mile. Today it's 21.6. The legal name of our town is capital D, lowercase e, space, capital S, lowercase O-T-O. In the 1980s, discussion was held regarding eliminating the space to save money on signage. Some started using the new spelling. Some still use it today in the city. We're not asking you to change anything. I'm just telling you the history. <laughs> but there is no documentation in DeSoto, Dallas County, or the state confirming that it was ever legally changed. So in honor of our founding fathers, Everything connected to today's event is using the original spelling. There are some accounts that DeSoto was named after explorer Hernando DeSoto. This is an example of why it's vitally important that we record history as it occurs and not depend on his story to convey the information to the next generation. In 1961, the first city manager, Dwayne White, was hired to serve not only as city manager, but also the city inspector. In 1848, T.J. Johnson, fresh from Tennessee, built a tiny general merchandise store near the crossroads. Located at the intersection of a wagon trail dirt road stretching north-south from Dallas to Shiloh Community in what is now Ellis County, and another running east-west from Lancaster to Cedar Hill, now known as Hampton and Beltline Roads. By the 1870s, a community developed around Johnson's store. S.E. Judah built a harness shop in the 1870s, and his son built a general store in 1898. In 1804, a post office was established. They came in covered wagons, horseback, in some cases on foot, to settle this land ripe with virgin forest streams and meadows. With Indians rampant in most all of Texas, it took a brave and adventurous soul to settle far from the protection of other small communities. Since the Republic of Texas was anxious to entice settlers to the financially troubled new state, the Texas legislature passed a bill on February 4, 1841, granting impresario rights to the men of the Peters Colony settlement. Sometimes it's known as the Texas Land and Emigration Company. The men who organized this push for settlers were staid businessmen, and it is doubtful if many of them ever came to Texas or even to the U.S. Eleven of the original organizers were from London and nine from the U.S. An even more unlikely prospect for a land impresario was William S. Peters, who was recognized as the organizing force behind the settlement of this area. He was an Englishman and music publisher in Louisville, Kentucky. He viewed the colony primarily as a business venture. Influenced by the philanthropic ideas of William Goodwin, I'm sorry, Godwin, and Thomas Paine, but also thinking the colony would provide new opportunities for the English industrial middle class. The headquarters for Peters Colony was in Louisville, Kentucky, where he and his son, William C. Peters, opened a music store in the 1830s. It was documented that he published the music of Stephen Foster, who had such hits as Beautiful Dreamer and The Old Folks at Home. The Silver Serenaders included some of Stephen Foster's music in their program today. Together with his son-in-law, Samuel Browning, he the music store in June 1839 to England and France on behalf of the colony. He returned in 1841 with news from London for his U.S. investors, and in August he went to Austin, and Browning signed the first of four contracts with the Republic of Texas. The first contract established boundaries beginning at the Red River at the mouth of Big Mineral Creek, running south for 60 miles, then west for 22. The impresarios were bound to the contract to recruit settlers from outside the Republic 
at a rate of 200 families in three years. They were allowed to retain up to a half of the colonist's grant as payment for services rendered, including land surveys and title applications. They provided powder, shot, and seed, and in some cases built the settlers' log cabins. The Curtis Parks family provided a log cabin for our first schoolhouse. There was no indoor plumbing or heat or air. Classes were held when there were no farm chores to be done. We had no high school, we had no chamber of commerce, we had no Roy Orr, we had churches, a general store or two, and miles separated each farmstead. Boundaries included parts of Duncanville, Cedar Hill, Glen Heights, and Ovilla and beyond. The only news came by horseback or wagon every four to six weeks from the settlement, which would become Dallas. Toad Holler was the name of our early school and the namesake for our annual Toad Holler Creek Fest. There were no paved streets, only dirt tracks created by mule and horse-drawn wagons. On November 20, 1841, the Texas Agricultural, Commercial, and Manufacturing Company was formed in Louisville, Kentucky to offset some of the London financial backing that had fallen off. Peters made several trips back and forth and he was able to include part of 26 North Texas counties in the expanded Peters colony. In this initial contract, Peters promised to introduce into Texas a colony of 600 families within three years. The Republic of Texas agreed to grant 640 acres of land to each married man and 320 to each single man over 17 if they settled within the prescribed boundaries of the contract. The only stipulation of the contract was that they be of good moral character. This ad was in the Bonham Weekly on February 25, 1842. To immigrants, now within the Republic of Texas, the undersigned agent of the Peters Colony takes this method to say that to all families who proceed to the colony, make their selection, build their cabins, and occupy same on or before the first day of June next, 640 acres or one section of land will be given, and young men over 17 years, a half section or 320 acres, Mere visit and selection without improvement is indispensable. Temporary absence after settlement does not forfeit your rights. To the land-starved people of the already settled eastern states, this was a boon. They came from every direction. The first wave of settlers in this area was 1844 to 45, and it consisted of a total of 822 colonists. The second wave from 1846 to 1848 consisted of 1,286 settlers. Although very few settled in the immediate area, the Nance family came in 1847 and stayed until 1950. 103 years on this very land where people in the community worked on farms, went to church, and educated their children. The city of DeSoto is located on the original land grants of W. Caldwell, Zebedee Heath, T. Rhodes, and Curtis Parks. It was founded by the Curtis Parks, Thomas Cheshire, Otway B. Nance, David Q. Nance, F. M. Hamilton, John P. Voorhees, Ramsey, and Johnson families. The Ramsey's daughter, Mary, who was born in 1846, was reportedly the first white child born west of the Trinity in Indian Territory. She eventually married another settler named R.M. Hamilton and lived in DeSoto until she was 94 years old. Pioneer families and their 288 names represented on the display in this tent. Without your forefathers taking a significant risk to leave their homes in Tennessee, Illinois, Kentucky, and beyond, to travel by wagon and horseback for several months across Indian Territory to find the Texas Prairie and settle here in the heart of the Peters Colony, DeSoto would not exist. The History of DeSoto book, which was printed in 1989, tells us the stories, his stories, submitted by pioneer descendants. Our town is now 22 years older. 
We have grown our population and our diversity. It is incumbent upon all of us to work together to record the history that has evolved since 1989 and become better stewards of recording as we go instead of relying on his stories to pass on to the next generation. Now it's time for the Sermon on the Amount. As, as you went on your tour, you may have noticed some price tags periodically. These are the thumbnail sketch of the estimated cost to restore each of the components remaining in phases one through four. We are looking for creative ways in today's economy to find funding so that we can continue to move forward. Those of you that have already provided donations in connection with this event, we sincerely thank you for your generosity. If others would like to find out how they can help and want to add us to your outreach budgets, either the company you work for or uh, your family or whatnot, we'll be glad to talk with you about creative ways that we can help you with match funding programs for your employees or a co-op with your family. If you'd like to be invoiced monthly, quarterly, or annually, we can arrange for that as well. If you'd like to create endowments or bequests, we can collaborate with you. Once this project is completed, it will provide a destination for historians, unique venue for guests staying in our hotels and motels, a gathering place for scout activities, civic organizations, book clubs, pioneer celebrations, holiday tree lighting and caroling, Easter egg hunts, DeSoto night out, small weddings, showers, reunions, chamber events, political campaigns, retreats, etc. DeSoto history needs to be saved before it's lost forever. We hope that you'll feel free to stroll the grounds before the shuttle takes you back to your cars and enjoy some more of Chef Carlos's treats. But please come back with your children, grandchildren, neighbors, and friends on April the 28th. We are going to have the grand opening for the public, and it will include such things as a chuck wagon, Dutch oven cook-off, vintage games, interactive demonstrations of quilting, pottery, leather crafts, farriers, and farm animals, and hopefully some more music. Now I'd like to invite Renee Thomas and her team to come up to give the results of the silent auction. Okay, do I have all of the bid forms for the silent auction on the centerpieces? And everyone take a nice long look at these beautiful centerpieces. They have the gated handwork, SNS signs, and Don Dewberry. And we are so appreciative to Tina Strand and Don Dewberry for putting together these beautiful centerpieces. And we have several winners. So uh, if your name is called, please see Ms. Merriman. And complete your payment and pick up your centerpiece. So I'll start with James and Pam Dean, Councilwoman Patricia Ledbetter, Mr. Grant Gallifor, Mr. Bill Rishi, Mr. Charles, is this Reed? Reed? Okay. Mr. Jim Strong, where'd Jim go? Oh, he's behind the, behind the wall. He's hiding from me. <laughs> Ms. Marilyn Hurt and Sherry Nance and Ms. Lee Merriman. So all of you will pick, be able to pick up your centerpieces and pay for them over at the table to, to my left, to your right. Thank you for your generous contribution and enjoy your beautiful piece. And also, if you have other contributions to make, you may continue to make those as well. We thank you for your support of DeSoto and of Nance Farms. <laughs>